the 20th of October, 1995, newspapers across the UK screamed that there was a new scare for women on the contraceptive pill. A government communication had gone out to doctors across the UK warning that there was a new study that showed that certain contraceptive pills doubled the risk of blood clots. And this was the result. I was in my early 20s at the time. Having started working as a journalist after leaving university, I was now embarking on a new career in communications, and I was on one of these pills. And so were many of my friends. And this was all we could speak about. Should we stop taking the medicine? And if so, what contraception should we use? Immediately, what felt like a safe, everyday activity now felt like a huge risk. I needed to ask an expert for help. Luckily, I happened to have the contact details of a gynecologist and family planning expert who I could call on, my dad. <laughs> as soon as he picked up the phone, and it was a landline back in 1995, my dad could hear the worry in my voice. In a really calm way, he explained what the data meant for me. He said that for the majority of women who, like me, didn't smoke and had no risk factors for blood clots, it was fine to keep taking the pill. He dived into the data and explained that a tiny risk of a blood clot, one person in every 7,000, had doubled to a slightly bigger but still small risk of two people in every 7,000. Importantly, he said it was important to look at the wider context of having reliable contraception and what would happen if I fell pregnant. The risk of a blood clot in pregnancy was much, much higher than the risk of a clot on the pill. I breathed a huge sigh of relief and felt I was now able to make a reasonable decision based on information that I now understood. I was incredibly fortunate to have ready access to someone who knew the data and could communicate it to me in a way that was meaningful. But thousands of women didn't have that opportunity. The science and reporting that led to this issue became known as the pill scare. And in the following months, UK pregnancies spiked up 5%, and the abortion rate, which had been falling, went up 8%. Behind each of these statistics are people people who found themselves facing an unplanned pregnancy because they'd been frightened by the reporting. Science is integral to our lives. Every day, we make decisions based on scientific information from the food we eat or don't eat, the exercise we do, the transport we use, to government policy on energy and climate. This was so obvious during the pandemic, when governments, global health institutions, and scientists all grappled to communicate the rapidly emerging science around COVID-19. And yet, science communication is rarely included in science and medical school curricula. What became clear to me in a very personal way during the pill scare was that how research is shared matters. Over the years since then, I've had the privilege of working with a number of scientists on huge topics in science and medicine, and I've dedicated my career to science communication. And I've developed a three-part checklist that can help scientists communicate their work in a way that's truly relevant. The first part of the checklist is to talk about people rather than numbers and statistics. My dad hadn't talked about numbers. He put the numbers in human terms and what the data meant for me. Numbers and statistics are impersonal and can be scary. They can also be easily misinterpreted. Focusing on people builds connection and can help people really understand the science. And this principle works even when people aren't the focus of the science, because scientists are people. We can build connection through their stories, struggles, and victories. The enormity of the discovery of the Higgs boson, or God particle, was humanized when, at the highly technical announcement, the CERN team cheered, and the camera zoomed in on 83-year-old Professor Higgs, who wiped a tear from his eye after seeing his life's work validated. 
The second part of the checklist is to start with the headline. My dad started with a headline that was relevant to me. I shouldn't stop taking the pill. But so often, science is not communicated so clearly. Mostly, science is communicated the same way it's done, starting with the background and the hypothesis, talking about which methods were used and which statistics, then coming to the results, and finally coming to the conclusion. It requires time, and it's a bit like a detective story. The good bits are at the end. But today, we're living in the attention economy, and we're constantly bombarded with information, and people just don't have the time or the patience to listen to all this detail. That's where my background in journalism is valuable. Journalists start with the headline to grab attention, starting with the most important information that's relevant and interesting for the audience. So if you're a researcher working on a new treatment for Alzheimer's disease, instead of starting by talking about the illness and then the study design in multiple countries with thousands of patients all around the world, and then telling me the results, it's more impactful to lead with new study shows Alzheimer's decline can be slowed. The third part of the checklist can help us find what the right headline should be. And we do this by focusing on what the science can do, rather than how the science was done. This works really well for everyday science, because it can help us understand why something matters, even when it's not immediately obvious. So the discovery of a new gene might open the door to earlier diagnosis of an illness, or provide the next question for research. It's also vital for huge breakthroughs so that the news has a chance to be communicated responsibly. So instead of going into detail about the discovery of H. pylori as the cause of certain peptic stomach ulcers, instead, we talk about how some people with hugely painful and debilitating stomach ulcers can now be effectively treated with a simple course of antibiotics. So, that's the checklist. People, headline, do. I like to think of it as a communications PhD. <laughs> now, in the era of Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn, unlike in 1995, scientists can communicate beyond scientific channels and beyond journalists directly to broad audiences. The digital age has removed the gatekeepers. But for science to have true impact, it must be communicated well. And who better to speak accurately about science than the experts who did the work themselves? Many scientists tell me that speaking outside of their immediate professional environment can be scary. They're worried that their work might be miscommunicated, misinterpreted, or misunderstood. But in the attention economy, this is exactly why communication skills are essential. Nothing is more inspiring than seeing a scientist communicate their work confidently and effectively, so the science has the impact it deserves, and the people who need to know can fully understand it. For this to happen, science communication must become a routine and essential part of the scientific research process. And it can be as simple as adding a P-H-D. Thank you. <laughs>